Hello, and welcome to today's episode. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Paul Honeycutt, a corporate transformations expert, as well as a podcast host and published author. Today, Paul shares his incredible story of overcoming tremendous adversity and learning to love and accept himself and embrace his true identity. Paul was raised within the strict confines of the Jehovah's Witness Church and at an early age discovered that he was gay. This realization completely clashed with the ethics and the values of the church and led to a cascade of negative emotions, including doubt, self-hatred, shame, and guilt. Paul eventually faced complete isolation as his entire church community and his family rejected him. Paul shares an incredible story of resilience and self-acceptance as he shares his experiences, insights, and lessons that he learned along the way. I hope you will find today's episode informational as well as truly inspirational. Hello, and welcome to the Connected Community Podcast, a place to explore possibility through mindfulness, movement, and self-discovery. Our intention is to deliver insight and inspiration while fostering conversations that are genuine, unfiltered, and deeply human. We hope you will enjoy today's episode. Hello, Paul. How are you today? Hi there, Nikki. I'm doing great. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm so excited to be interviewing you today. I was hoping that we could discuss what it was like for you growing up as a Jehovah's Witness. And I'm most curious about how, at a really young age, you discovered that those ideals and um, perspectives that they held weren't quite congruent with what your ideals were. Um, but before we begin, I would love to hear what currently you're most passionate about. What I am most passionate about right now, I am really, really intrigued <laughs> about kayaking. So I have, <laughs> I have um, been kind of obsessed about kayaking and river rafting. Um, and I think what that really just speaks to what's passionate to me is this kind of newfound um, desire to experience a lot of new things. And I think that comes from kind of tie into my childhood and so I sort of feel like I'm in this like early 20s stage of my life of like, oh, maybe I'm really interested in this or let me go try that. So I think I'm just, that's what I would say I'm passionate about is being open about that. There's work stuff and all those things, but what's sitting in my heart right now is like nature. Yeah, me too. So I was I was reading um, some of the things that you put up online, and you refer to yourself as growing up as a, in a cult. And I know that you broke out of that system. And so I would love to hear what that was like for you and what, what your experience was, especially at a young age, discovering a, a little bit more about yourself and your sexuality and how that didn't fit into the paradigm of what um, Jehovah's Witnesses were going to approve of. Sure. Yeah, I think, you know, my perspective has changed a little bit, but when I looked at my story for a long time, I was really like sad and detached and angry about the way that I was raised. Um, you know, what I explain to people is because my parents chose into being Jehovah's Witnesses. So, their perspective on life is very different. They will never have understood what it was like for us as kids to have to, to grow up in that. They both came from prominent families that, you know, they had normal childhoods of at least like birthdays and holidays. And um, my mom was like the popular girl and my dad was the captain of the football team. So, you know, that experience for them was very different. And to choose into being Jehovah's Witness and in that cult, you know, they did that as adults. Their children, however, 
we didn't have that choice. It was from the very beginning, the get go of our lives and my life was built all around that, that, that belief structure. I think where it really started to come hit home was obviously kindergarten, like right when you go to school, because in, you know, before that I'm with my family, I'm with other Jehovah's witnesses, you're young, your brain's impressionable. You're not aware maybe of that you're different. But going to school, it was, I think, the very first day of school, in fact, um, it was a kid's birthday, and the mother was bringing in cupcakes. And my teacher, Mrs. Inman, took me out into the hallway and was like, hey, you know, you're going to have to sit out here while they have, while they have um, the cupcakes and, and birthday celebration. And I sort of knew, like, oh, yep, that's okay. Um, but you know, when you're a kid and you're hearing everybody else celebrating and having fun, and then you're sitting out against the wall, that's a real quick impression. Like you don't belong. And what was really crazy is the other day I was looking through, my mom had saved a bunch of like each year had like a folder of like my school stuff and projects and pictures and it was really interesting to dive into that. But I opened up that kindergarten one and I looked and this note fell out and I've never had seen this note before, Nikki. And it was written from my, that Mrs. Inman and she's, it was around Halloween. And she said, she, you know, Mrs. Honeycutt, I, you wanted me to reach out if there ever there was a problem. And she's like, and I, I put on the Halloween record for all the kids and Paul lost it, was crying and freaking out. And I had to like, we had to take the the record off. All the kids said that they could do it another day. He couldn't get them calmed down. She's like, we have, we have a problem and you need to know about it. And so, you know, I always knew that I was very different from others. Anyways, we had to take a, a, a stand of not pledging allegiance to the flag you know, so at five years old and at that time, that was a big deal. Like you had to stand and pledge allegiance and we had to sit. And so to sit while everybody else is standing, you know, at five years old and six years old, that sends a message. I mean, yes, you just not many adults could even do that nowadays. They, you know, to stand up at that point. But it, for me as a kid to have to do it without a real understanding, and there was a lot of other things that just came up over time that really, impacted me with um feeling less than or you know not normal we weren't able to hang out with kids from school that was like a non sequitur you don't hang out with anybody that's not a jehovah's witness because they're considered bad association so pretty much on the outside that that sense of feeling you know n not belonging and then when you had asked about like sexuality you know, really that started to peak when most any human is starting to kind of become aware of their sexual, their sexuality, no matter what your preference is. Um, and I knew that it was, I, I don't know if I knew that it was wrong, but I knew that it was different. I knew that there was something different about me. Because I saw in like other friends, like, the, you know, the boys and girls starting to get all like, and I was like, I don't care, but like Bobby's really cool. Like, I want to hang out with Bobby. And, um, you know, as it progressed over time, I started getting called fag in school and teased. And I had already been teased about being a Jehovah's Witness. I have really bright red cheeks, so I would always get called rosy. Um, and so I would get teased about that. So there was a lot of like those things and this isn't, you know, by any means like, Oh, woe is me. It was just stuff I kind of had dealt with and was like, okay. And I'm, you know, just like trudge through. Um, but I think things really escalated where for me, when I started to not feel good, like I got physically really sick when I was about 10 and, or 11 years old and like super stressed out. I mean, even my parents were like, you were always super, super stressed. And it's because I knew that things were different. And about that time was when 
like language started to come in where I kind of understood what people meant by saying fag or what gay was or what being homosexual was. And it was like, oh, I think that's me. And in fact, one time, like I had to do give a talk. So you learned to be a public speaker. Um, and I, or at least I did. And you were assigned these different topics. And so one of them was in this book. It was called Questions Young People Ask, Answers That Work which I, I would love for anybody to get that nowadays and like, just read it. You'd be like, Oh my goodness. I can't believe these, this is what they give teenagers. But, um, why well, I was assigned one of these to do a Bible discussion around why homosexuality was wrong. And I'm on stage. I'm having to talk about, I'm talking about myself and I knew it. You, you were asked to give a talk to the church about that topic. Uh, -huh. yeah. So Let me, one second, I want to just backtrack just a teeny bit because yeah. I think a lot of people aren't familiar with when you're saying that you couldn't have a cupcake and you had to go sit outside the classroom. And um, I think a lot of people aren't familiar, at least I wasn't, um, about all the different rules and regulations about what is okay and what isn't okay and how even at five, um, there were, there was, you were excluded from mm -hmm. so many, so many things that everyone else was experiencing. Yes. Um, so before we go into 10 and 11, I'd love for you to share some of those really young experiences that you missed out on and what were the beliefs and the reasons behind those. Yeah. So Jehovah's Witnesses, I refer to them as a cult. And the really the reason behind that is because of the shaming and shunning that happens. Um, and the other part about it is really like the cognitive dissidence. And then there's this hypervigilance that gets built in. So when I was, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that they actually call it the truth. So that's what they refer to it as is the truth. And they believe that they are the true religion of God. Um, and they believe that Jehovah is God, that Jesus was just God's son, um, but that Jesus is not God. And, um, a lot of their primary beliefs come from a, what they believe is a direct translation of the Bible and interpretation of the Bible that basically man and wife, the wife is to be subservient to the, you know, she's to be submissive to the husband. Um, they don't believe in celebrating, uh, birthdays. They don't believe in celebrating any holiday at all. Um, but even like 4th of July, New Year's, anything that's secular, anything that's pagan, anything that is religious, they do not celebrate. The only thing that they, I, I wouldn't even call it a celebration, but that they observe, and they actually call it an observance of the memorial of Christ's death, which falls in line with like Passover, Easter for a lot of other religions. Um, and that was like really somber, like kind of thing. So although we grew up in a community that was very, very social, so we always had people around, we always had things to do, but it was always with Jehovah's Witnesses and always talked about. The other parts were like, you didn't salute the flag. You don't, you know, you take a stand against those type of things. Um, and so, you know, in that really young period of life, when you're first forming Again, I just go back to like it was it was constantly busy with Jehovah's Witness stuff. So like on the weekends, we went out door to door ministry, knocking on people's doors. Sunday, it was church. Pretty much every evening, there was something related to the religion that was taking place. And that really created a sense of... It was exhausting because when you look at like the stories they would tell you as a kid, everything was fear-based. So it was that you were, you were wrong, you were sin, like there's original sin, you are a sinner from birth. Like your, your job basically is to do the best you can, pray every day, you know, strive to be perfect in an imperfect world with the hopes that you'll get to have everlasting life. and they even have a book that that give are get, is given to kids. It's called My Book of Bible Stories. And when if you were to see it, Nikki, 
like I know you have a, a, a child, son, you would not want them seeing the illustrations and the stories that are being told at a young age. They're it's like it's damnation and hell. It's all and... damnation and hell and evil and like Satan and Armageddon is coming. So I grew up with this like intense sense of fear of everything. It was always like fear because what they lived in was this fear of like the end is coming. The end is coming. We have to be ready for the end. We have to be ready for the end. We have to be prepared. Well, my parents as adults were maybe better able to handle that because they had they had already lived life. They're dealing with, you know, they, they're coming from a mature level. As a kid, when that's all you hear, that's all you see. That's everything you think about. And so not only that, you already have this fear, then you're weird. Like kids at school, you know, are doing, celebrating and doing these different things and you have to sit out and the teachers, the teachers were doing their best, but they'd be like, oh, Paul, you need to leave because we're going to be doing this thing. Oh, okay. Like I get my books and go, you know, Wait, sometimes. Did your mom, did your mom specify that at the school in kindergarten? Like this is the guidelines you need to pull them out if the kids are having a birthday. Did yes. She not only that. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Her and my dad did, but not only that, Nikki, they gave us literature and it was our job to give it to our teacher and to explain to the teacher at five that every year oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah. you would have to do it they didn't do it I, I i think maybe kindergarten she did maybe first but i remember it was always i was given the literature i had to take and i had to say i have to give this to you or you know i'm giving this to you so that you understand you know my beliefs and would explain that Mm-hmm. anyway it didn't even matter probably if they did because as a kid it just impacted me that i'm like having to sit here and tell this adult like i can't do these things mm-hmm. and even you know extracurricular stuff you can't do you know if it took anything away from the truth um and that's how i'll refer to it as the truth because it's just like that's what they say but if it t- and that's what they would tell me like if it takes away from the truth like we just can't do that like you so my mom enrolled me in gymnastics and I, which i'm really surprised that she did that but i got really good but i got good enough where then they you know it was so i wanted to do competitions and i could and i loved it i got pulled out because you couldn't interact with outsiders? because it was going to take away from the time the truth the time and same with music same with any extracurricular like my little brother was super into sports and he wanted to play sports he couldn't do any of that but it was if it didn't if it wasn't involved in the truth then it had no place in your life and so then jumping to 10 when you're having to give a sermon to the whole church about how being gay is sinful and horrible um did how did you wrap your head around that or what was that like? You know, I think at the time, first of all, I am the kind of person who really likes to be, to succeed. And I, I like being on stage. (laughs) And so even from a young age, like my parents said that, like you were all, all, I was always performing, you know, they would like, you're the storyteller creating plays, you know, so I think partly being on stage, it was like, oh, this is cool. I have a mic. I, they're all eyes are on me um, kind of thing. But I do remember as I was like having to talk about that, and I think I was probably a little older than 10 for sure when I gave that talk. Um, but I know that from wrapping my head around it, it was more like, oh, I, the devil, the devil got me. The devil I'm, got me. I'm bad. I'm wrong. I'm bad. I'm wrong. I'm I'm evil. I gotta pray this away. Like, what did I do wrong? What happened to me? Why can't I stop these feelings? Um, and I think around that time, I know when I gave that talk that that started to be where I really started to feel a lot of shame and just humiliation around like I don't what do I do? Like, I don't, I don't know what to do because it's not stopping. Did you feel accepted by the church and the community 
outside of your own feelings, did you feel they loved and accepted you? Oh, everybody loves me. I mean, I, I'm easy to get along with. And I, and I don't say that from like an egotistical, like people just love me. I love people. I love people's stories. I never really was interested in the kids my age. I always wanted to be around the adults and hear their stories. So I think, yeah, people always wanted me around. And my mom, my mom and dad and all my siblings would be like, you were the, everybody wanted you around. You got invited everywhere. Um, so did they love me? They loved me for what I was, I think, innate, you know, who I am. But I think that they all knew that I was gay. My mom even said, like, a lot of people knew, like, oh, he's gay, you know. And that wasn't loved. So it was conditional. Mm -hmm. And what age do you think people knew? Well, my mom told me, this was much later when my dad passed away, that she knew from the time I was born. She said, my, your dad and I knew. Mm -hmm. We just kind of knew. So what was your experience of coming out? Well, that happened a little bit. That happened much later. Um, when I was about 26, I was outed. But up until then, before that, when I was really impactful piece that happened to that that I experienced was around 15. So I had gotten my driver's license in a car when I was 14 and started working. And I had to pay for my car like, you know, I took care of everything. It was really responsible. Um and I had found where a, a gay coffee shop. I had searched it out. I was constantly looking Nikki for like who am I? And what I, for the longest time, thought that all the gays lived in San Francisco. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, I thought that's where they all were. Like, nowhere else, but only San Francisco. And this um, is and prior it, internet, prior to internet. Prior internet, game, yeah. prior to any of that. And mm -hmm. that anybody from California, there was a high likelihood that they were gay. Uh, <laughs> I just had this, like, <laughs> mindset. Yeah. And so, you know, I was always curious. and. And about trying to figure figure it out, and I think a lot of kids are. You know, we're just trying to figure ourselves out, no matter what, who you are, uh, gay or straight. So, anyways, I found this coffee shop, kind of back off a uh, uh, main street, and I went in. And it took me a couple times to get the nerve to go in, and then when I went in, you know, I'm sure they were like, "Who is this young kid?" Um, but it just felt kind of good. And I ordered a coffee and I thought it was so like sophisticated and, you know, sitting there and, um, there was an 18 or over, like there was uh, books, but then there was like a, an adult section in the back. I mean, I snuck back there and, you know, that was like my first time seeing anything like, like porn. And so, you know, that was exciting. And yet also confronting and like all sorts of different emotions of like, I, this is great, but uh, this is not right. And, you know, this inner tur turmoil. But what happened was I realized that there was cruising that happened. So one night I had gotten a job down in the city. And I told my parents that I was going to have to be late, like stalking the shelves or whatever. And I went over there. I wanted to see what it was all about. I was really curious. And essentially what happened, I put myself in a pretty dangerous situation when I look at it now, but um, I ended up getting picked up by a guy. Things took place um, like super quick. <laughs> um, and so I, I had no, I didn't really understood. I I didn't understand exactly what all was taking place until like it had, it was like, and I got back in the car and it was like I, a whirlwind of emotions and excitement and fear and shame and self judgment and kind of loathing. And not long after that happened, um, one of my older friends who was a Jehovah's witness had gone to Bethel and Bethel was there headquarters the worldwide headquarters and he had applied and been accepted and like that's that would be like getting into princeton or harvard 
you know, and all Jehovah's Witness parents are just like, oh, my son has made it. And we were throwing a, um, a party for him at the house and he brought me an application. So I was four years younger than him. And he said, uh, he's like, I brought you an application that way you have it and you can come too. And, and I thought that that's, that was what, to, I mean, that was like what my parents and what that religion puts out is like, you, you go to Bethel or you go into missionary work. And that is like, you know, solving world peace. Um, that's, that's the way to go about it. And when I looked at that, I looked at the application that evening after everybody left and it asked questions like, have you had homosexual thoughts? Have you ever had, you know, homosexual acts? Have you, it's several other questions all around that. And I, I just was crushed because I was like, oh no, like, I, I mean, I have, and I already know this is wrong. And now that I've done this, like, what do I do? And my mom came in the living room, the family room and saw me sitting there and she sat down and asked me what was going on. And I just broke down crying and I told her, um, and what's interesting is we, we don't, we really haven't talked much in our life, but she brought that up in a conversation about a year ago that she remembered that, that night. And that when she, she's like, you were just in tears, bawling, sobbing, she's like and i just looked at you and she's like i've thought about this for and it would be almost 20 years 20 plus years um she's like i why i couldn't reach over and put my arm around you and say i loved you and that it was going to be okay and she's like and why i was so cold and just told you to go talk to your dad which Wait, well, did she understand the reason why you were crying uh -huh, i told her you told her okay mm -hmm. you told her what I told her that those questions like that, I, that like, I can't go to Bethel now. And she said, why? And I said, cause I think I'm gay. And, um, I was smart enough to not mention that I had gone cruising. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I said it was a kid at school. So I lied like, and I got, you get really good. A lot of Joe's witnesses. One of my older siblings said that she's like, they taught me to lie because you had to, always lie to figure out like how to be safe or not to be because everybody's watching you to see if you're doing good. Um, so I told my dad and then my dad said that I had to talk to the elders and that when I talked to the elders, like they took me in a room, it was three of them, older men. These are guys that I knew. And in detail, they asked me to explain what happened, like describe what everything looked like, what happened, how long it was in my mouth, everything did, you know, like, did I take my clothes off? What was I doing with my hands? And for like three hours and brought the Bible out, told me why I was wrong. And then I got reproved, which meant for six months, nobody outside of my family could talk to me. Couldn't interact with you at all. Could interact. So, but I had to go to the, all the meetings and everything to just sit there. And they didn't know the reason. They just knew that they couldn't speak to you or like outcast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you that happened at about 15. Yeah. That, I can't even imagine <laughs> what that would feel like. <laughs> so, Lonely, so a, isolation and shame and guilt and confusion. All sorts of things. I mean, I hated it. And I had already hated going to the meetings, like, because it was every night, every night, every day had something that we had to do. So you never got a break from it. And it was rare, even on Saturdays, that the one thing, and this is so weird, like, I couldn't do anything that people couldn't talk to me. But the one thing that I could still do was you had to go knock on doors. And so I could be with my parents and go knock on doors. And so I had to do that. So it's just this constant, like, what teenager wants to go knock on other teenagers' doors or go sell the Bible, you know, or be talking about it all the time? Um, and then on top of that, when you know that it's wrong, like you're being told it's you're wrong, Oh, it's, I hated myself. I hated myself. Mm -hmm. Do you feel they do that as a way of 
saying this is what it feels like like you you do something like this again and you're out and then you'll Mm -hmm. be isolated and this is what isolation feels like Mm -hmm. it's actually loving that's what they say we do this because we love you Mm -hmm. it doesn't feel very loving no it's i mean it's kind of uh it's very conditional and it's not even loving you know but that's what they and i think that happened that gets tossed out very easily of um don't hate the sinner, just hate the sin. That's essentially the same thing. It's conditional love. It's saying that who you are, you're not worthy of being or existing because you've done, you know, some mistake or, you know, anything like that. And that's really put a strong impression upon me. Like, I'm wrong. Not only am I wrong, but at that same time, that would have been started to be at the height of like the AIDS epidemic. So that got thrown in my face all the time. It's like, you're going to die. This is, this is why, and this is what, this is what is happening to them. And this is, they're bringing it upon themselves. During that time, how did your parents treat you in that six month period? Hmm. What was really interesting is that was the first time where my dad, his business, he started traveling a lot, which was not normal for a lot of Joe's witnesses because you always needed to be at the meetings. But my dad was gone a lot. And my mom and I were really close. And so for that, it was really um, cold. It was just cold. And so like I worked and I did my stuff, but it just, it just felt really cold and like their friends that they, they, because like I said, we had people over at the house all the time. So people would still come over. So these are people you're talking to all the time that suddenly that won't talk to you. And, and then you after six to, months, everyone's just like, Hey, Paul, like, is it just yes. normal? Yeah. Oh Weird. Like, welcome back kind of thing. And you know, you, so you're sitting at your own dining room table with all these people and you can't talk. And then my mom, then, you know, my mom's rule, and dad's was that I had to go to my room because it, we, I couldn't make it awkward for other people. It might have been easier. Oh, I, I mean, ultimately it was, but still this mm-hmm. it was this constant like rejection. rejection and our friends are more important the way you make us look. Like you've now made us look shameful as parents. And so after that experience, how did you move forward? Did you just stuff it all? Yeah, I, I, because I had found, you know, because I had the car and I needed to work, I really enjoyed working because that gave me that like a reprieve from being around the family. And it took me out of like some of the, the primary nights of meetings were Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. And then my, we would have all these other like, so I would work Mondays and, and Wednesdays and Fridays, and I could avoid some of the preparing things or the family study stuff. And so the, I really like that. Um, but I was constantly, I was doing my best to have fun, but I never felt like I belonged, even with the kids. I just never felt like I belonged and I was always like, what, where am I going to go with life? And I never really like suicidal during that time, but it was not easy, but I just remember how much I hated myself. And like every night I would just like be praying to God, please take this away. And, um, was pretty miserable from that standpoint. I was just like, what gives? What gives? Like, I just wanted relief. That's a really hard age, too. <laughs> Those teenage years. Yeah, everything's being, you know, as formative. And, um, you know, I, from a, like a dating standpoint, Jehovah's Witnesses don't encourage dating until, you know, after 18. But the typically it's, if you're not going to Bethel or any of those, a lot of people, like, you date at 18 and most are married at 18 or 19, you know, 20 get married pretty young. Um, and I was an eligible brother. Like a lot of, I mean, 
a lot of families wanted their daughters to like be with me. So like my mom would always laugh. She's like, Oh, they're wanting to hang out. Cause you know, they want to bring their daughter by you. And I liked all the, I liked all the girls. Like they were all super nice. Like, um, I just wasn't into any of them, which was kind of a protection because like I could say like, well, we're not supposed to date. We're not supposed to kiss or any of that kind of stuff. Cause that's wrong. Like, but you know, my friends, my guy friends would like come over and I remember, you know, it would be, you know, there's this like weird thing of like, I don't want them to know, but I'm also like super intrigued to like see them in their underwear because that's like what you're attracted to. And so, you know, or like camping, like one of my buddies, you know, like we slept on the same bed and it was like kind of a touch or whatever. And then it'd be like, oh, like, don't touch her. This, this weird exploration of self. Um, and I think a lot of kids are just awkward and weird anyways. It's teenagers. And then you add in the whole Jehovah's Witness stuff and being gay. It just, I've always felt like weird. And that people were going to know. Um, and so how do I hide it? And so then where did you go from, from there, from, from say getting into your early adulthood years? Yeah, I had, I had really learned very early on to jump into my imagination and I loved anything to deal with world travel like reading about other countries, National Geographic, anything to do with like kind of exploring. And I, because I was working, I, I started to save money. Like I was saving um, money and I wanted to have money to go. And ultimately I really did kind of want to go to, to college and I was getting pushed by teachers because it was really intelligent. And at the same time, I really wanted to travel overseas. Like that was my big thing. Like I wanted to go at 18, like oh, pack a bag, just travel. And I told my parents that, and they're like, well, you could be a missionary, but you can't just do that. You can't go do that because you've got to go to the meetings. You can't like, you have to be, you have to be in the congregation. You have to do those things. Um, Church first. Yeah, always. Mm -hmm. Um, and because I knew that I couldn't go to Bethel or I wasn't going to fill out that application because I wasn't going to say there was no way I was going to do that. Um, I started what was called regular pioneering. So I did that starting in high school where I went to school, I worked, and then I put in 110 hours a month in knocking on doors and I thought maybe that I would go to mission to their missionary school because that was like an ideal thing. And I was kind of being groomed to like do those things. And um, when I was 18, I graduated. I had asked my parents for round trip tickets to Europe. That's what I really wanted because they asked me, we'll get you what you want. And um, at my graduation, when I opened up my gift, they bought me a... Um, vacation package, a Jehovah's Witness tour of Brooklyn Bethel, of, of Bethel, and the, uh, then to go to D.C. to see the Holocaust Museum. Like, how fun is that as an 18-year-old? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's cool to get to travel to New York City. Um, oh, and here's a funny story. So I don't know what your listeners are and if this is appropriate or not, and you can, but, <laughs> so I had to, I had to, so they sent me to New York City and um I had to share a room with this brother, this older brother, like uh, who who was he was he was fine. But um there was a night they were all gonna go do something. I was like, Oh, I'm just really tired. I'm just gonna stay in. And I went and found like where the gay neighborhood was. I'm like, I gotta figure this out. Like, um, and so I just tooled around New York City. I had so much fun. I felt really like free. And everybody's like, oh, where'd you go? And I'm like, oh, I just, you know, took a, like a little walk around. And well, you shouldn't have done that. Um, but I found. You shouldn't even walk around town. Well, no, because they, it was like dangerous, but I don't ever get scared about places. Like, I'm, like I just feel really confident. And I found. Um, <laughs> I found an adult 
theater. And I'm like, like theater? No, or like movie theater. Like movie theater. Uh-huh. And so I went in and it was like there was like the straight like theaters and stuff and then down in the basement was like the gay one and I remember like going downstairs and it was like super creepy and I get down there and it's not that I was like into the porn it was just like to be around like I you know like because I couldn't go to the bars and I'm sitting in there for a few minutes I freak out I go to the bathroom and there's a couple guys in there and they're like checking me out and I'm like it was the most like thrilling thing I knew I wasn't going to do anything but it was just thrilling I thought I had was like I'm like, I'm going to move to New York City. I'm going to, this is where I need to be. Like, this is the cool, cool place. Um, In that moment, you didn't feel any shame. No, it just, it was like, this is cool. It feels free. It felt free to just like walk around the city and be around all that life. And it was like, I, I had always, and sometimes even to this day, I still have this like deep desire of just disappearing into the world. Like I do. It's just that idea sometimes is still like a, it's. It feels like to walk away. What that night felt like, and why sometimes I still feel like doing it is because it's like to walk away from any of the identities, any of the associations to who you are, and to just be really be able to like create from a, a standpoint where people don't know you and you just get to play with who you want to be. And I really felt that that night. Why do you not feel like you can do that now? Oh, I do. It's still, but sometimes I just fantasize about that idea of just like disappearing into the world. What would that, what would that fantasy look like? Um, I think what, what intrigues me about it is this, this ability to, like not feel obligated to a certain way of life. And so that's why I love and do a lot of travel is because like you get to go to these cities and you just meld in and you get to experience culture from a different standpoint. You get to go, you you know, take classes or you're in this, this environment or space that is just opened up where it's like, well, you can do whatever, you want nobody knows and you're on vacation go explore you want to take this class do that you go talk to those people um because i've met super super cool people you know from these other countries where even just a night over dinner at some random restaurant where you met people adds this vibrancy so i think it's like i can never get enough of that you did you broke out you broke out of that mold so how was that when did you do that when I was 20, 20, about 25, 26, I was outed. So I had started kind of really leading a different life. I had gotten a job that bosses really started to promote me. And I really saw like my potential and they saw my potential and I was doing really well. I was making more money. Um, and so like I had access to more um, resources and I started to realize that people who were not Jehovah's Witnesses were not evil because I'd always been told that they were evil. You don't hang out with people from work. You didn't hang out with non-Jehovah's Witnesses or non-believers. And suddenly I was hanging out with them and really liking them and they were fun and they liked me. And, you know, I had never been a drinker, never done anything. And, you know, I had some drinks and like, that was fun. And, you know, going to movies or going to concerts, how do you get outed? How, what is that? How do you how do you get outed by other people? So what happened for me in my situation was that I had met a guy and was we were dating, and he was an ex Jehovah's Witness himself. He happened to tell a friend of his who was an ex Jehovah's Witness, and she was the daughter of a family that I was really close with, and so she told them, and within an hour of her saying it had gone all around and to my parents, everybody that like I was dating a man, you know, that I was 
leading a, a homosexual lifestyle. And my next, my brother called me, my oldest brother who lived here in Colorado with me, called me the next day. And he, you know, when he picked up the, when I picked up the phone, he called me a fucking faggot and said, you know, you're disgusting. You can't hang out. What are you doing? You know better than this. You can't be around your nieces. Mom and dad are going to call you. You need to go to the elders. The elders started calling. My parents who lived in New Mexico were like, we're going to come up. You need to talk to the elders. My parents came up. I did not let them. I ignored them. I didn't let them into my apartment building. Um, so you were already out, but then you got outed to your whole Jehovah's Witness community. To the whole community. Yeah. And within 24 hours, they were done. Your yeah, I got, like, it all got cut off. And really, I'd only known Todd, the guy that I was dating. I didn't really know a lot of other people, so I didn't have a lot of community. Didn't know people. Um, and I mean, it was an exciting time because I was kind of prepared. I knew at some point that I was going to come out, but it wasn't, I wasn't quite ready for it to happen that way, but everything happens for a reason. And I'm really glad ultimately that that did happen because it kind of ripped a bandaid off and it started to open a lot of new doors for me. Um, and you, did you have a support system outside of outside of no. the Jehovah's Witness community? I mean, they weren't really a support system anyway. No, I didn't really know anybody because Todd and I broke up right after and that it was just me and I was working. So I kind of had like some support from friends at work, but even that, that was minimal. And um, one of my employees introduced me to as happens, you know, they're always like, you're gay. I have a gay friend you need to meet. Um, <laughs> okay. We're all going to like each other. We're definitely going to like each other. <laughs> yeah. We're definitely going to like each other. But, uh, and you're definitely going to be attracted to each other, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you definitely, oh, this is going to work out. But um, no, she, it was funny because she introduced, she's like, hey, I have a, a really good friend. His name is Paul and his partner, Mark. Um, you should meet them. And, um, because my employees didn't really know what was going on. I also didn't share a lot, but she kind of, I think, got a good sense of it. And so she, she introduced me to them, and they were really um, important at that time because they became a really good resource of, of friends and connections, and they knew a lot of people, and they had dealt with the whole coming out stuff. Paul had been raised in a cult, and so we kind of were able to talk from that aspect. Um, and they were just way more supportive and introduced me to a lot of people. In fact, they got me, helped get me a, an even better job. And um, so then I kind of started to find, you know, community. But even w within the queer community, I just never felt exactly myself either. Because it was like I was doing the things that I thought it now meant to be gay. So I did what I thought I needed to do to be a good Jehovah's Witness. And then it's like, okay, well, this is what you do to, when you're gay. And this is how you be. And, but that didn't feel totally authentic either. And, you know, my career really started to take off. And so I really put a lot of focus on that. I guess that's not a unique situation when somebody comes out that they can potentially be rejected by their community and their family and their, and their mm -hmm. systems. Um, I'm sure you happens all the time. Mm -hmm. So how do, and then. I guess, how do you move from shame to acceptance? Because that's a huge one. Oh, it is a huge move. And I think, well, what, what, if I look back now, I think the first piece really came well before, several years before I was outed, about a year before I was outed, was when I had a realization that I really had a choice of either I stay a Jehovah's Witness and I just shove this down, get married, mm -hmm. or I choose to be myself. Like and and actually acknowledge that I was gay. I'd always kind of I knew I was gay, but I was laying on this trampoline under the stars and I was like, I'm gay. I, I am gay. I'm gay. It's not I I and I can't shove it down. Like I, I can't, 
I can't do that. And that was the first really freeing moment where I felt a big sense of shame or weight come off just internally of like an acceptance of myself, that real acknowledgement of like, you are gay. You're, this is, so you're going to be you. I'm not going to get married, but now I got to figure all that out because it was, you know, like, how do I walk away from all of these belief systems, structure, community? I would say that's the first step. And over time, a lot of it has just come down to doing some deep work on myself and understanding that I was born worthy. I'm worthy of love. I'm worthy of being whole and, and accepted for who I am. Um, not by anybody else, me, I need to see myself as worthy. Um, and as I started to get more into like my personal development and as my career came along and I met other like queer people that were like me, that were, you know, I found like a sense of community or friends that like deeper conversations and that were, you know, in their careers and building lives and had partners and, um, you know, I learned a lot through them of, and, and conversations about like how to address like the shame, like did therapy, I've done all sorts of different stuff, but probably the biggest issue, probably the biggest amount of shame that really started to release for me was when I actually focused on the, my sexual health and the shame around my sexuality, like head on look at it because society from my perspective was always it's wrong it's wrong it's wrong you're told it's wrong even the even like when my partner and i would walk and hold hands but then suddenly we see straight people and we wouldn't hold hands or in restaurants sometimes you didn't want to show affection and not that we didn't feel sick, but it was like, oh, well, we just don't want to draw attention or it's so you're, there's like constant kind of like micro little bits of like, it's not safe or this isn't right. But where it really started to heal was when I took on the my actual like, what is sexuality to me? Mm-hmm. How am I as a sexual being? What are my desires? Why is it okay? what happened to me when I was a little kid that, that didn't impact me from a standpoint of like, that didn't make me who I am. That was just an event that happened. Um, and it was through a lot of self love, learning to like love myself and to like, I, I took a 40 day solo camping trip in nature. Nature's the best medicine, right? Like nature and solo time. And in those moments, I think when I really realized that I needed to build a relationship with myself, like really get to know myself and ask myself, who am I? Like, who am I? What do I want? What are the things I really love? What are the things I love about myself? What are the things that have always been there that I've been like really, really good at that I can be proud of? And what are the areas where it's like, I want to, to grow in or experience myself be different. So I just started to take myself head on. And like, I, I knew that I needed to do a lot of work or I wanted to do some work around healing my shame around being around other men, because mainly I had a lot of female friends, like a ton of women friends in my life. Like a lot of gay people have gay men and women are beautiful and they've supported, you know, they've been there to support me. So I'm not saying, but I needed to, address that or I wanted to because I knew that that was an area that where I still had shame about being who I was and being around men. And so I went and did a men's retreat and it was <laughs> within like the first hour Nikki I was like, "Oh my gosh." Like, well, what am I even worried about? Like these guys cuz it's full of a, like a bunch of straight like oh, warrior type guys mm-hmm. and I was just sitting there and I was like and what was, I was like, oh, they've got issues and challenges, not a judgment. You know, I'm just like, they're yeah. just like me. Um, I'm no less. Them. I don't need to be, you know, like, I don't need to be worried about myself. And the funny thing is, is a bunch of them were like, you are super intimidating. 
Oh my like gosh. <laughs> really intimidated by you. And I'm like, really? Like me? Almost all of them. Even the leader, even the, the like the two guys leading it, mm -hmm. that one, he was like, you're really intimidating. I said, is mm -hmm. it intimidating or is it just like I know who I am? Mm -hmm. And which intimidates so, people? Intimidates people. So that's my long answer to the mm -hmm. thing around shame was. I don't think shame is removed immediately, but it is a journey that is worth taking of, of looking at the different layers of peeling back the old beliefs and programs that have been kind of installed from family, from society, religion, from belief structures, and coming back to understanding more of who you are just as a, as a being yourself outside of anybody else's perspective. And then when you really build that love for yourself, the shame starts to go away. That negative self-talk is you're like, man, I, I really like myself. I love myself. I'm really cool. Look at all the things I've done. And I just don't think that we have ever been really trained or given the space to be like, Nikki, you're a badass. Like, you're so cool. Look at all the things. And I know your story, you know, a little bit of your story. And it's like, because we're oftentimes not, celebrating those things about others because we haven't done it yet for ourselves so you got to do it out for yourself first mm -hmm. to then be able to help others mm -hmm. what advice would you give someone who is in a situation no matter what age and they're just trapped in this community of non-acceptance to where they're feeling non-acceptance for their self, how, how would you guide someone? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's a great question. I think especially in, I can speak especially with like the queer community and having done like queer men work, queer work with men, like a men's group, um, and then just being active in the community. If somebody asks, I always there's three C's that are really important to me that I always kind of remind myself of is like being curious, knowing that I'm capable and how does this all connect? And I think it's scary. So my advice to somebody is like, understand you're capable and deserving. First of all, period of whatever your experience is, but say it's around like sexuality there are plenty of people out there that have gone through these experiences and are experts in different ways. If you are asking yourself, why do I feel bad about this? Or why is this, a, why am I feeling negatively about this? That's the first best step to be aware that you're actually thinking about it. I think the next steps are going to come down to do you want to find books where you can read about it? You know, there's therapy. You could do group work. There's a lot of different resources for you. What I would say is trust your intuition and what feels most drawn to you. For me, the work was, I just was like, I could read. I could go to a therapist. I could work with a guy, like a men's coach one-on-one. -on -one. Well, I want to go throw myself in the middle of a big group of gay or a big group of men and figure this out. That just felt right to me. So I think intuitively you kind of know, or you'll have an idea of something that feels like I really want to learn or figure this out. So then just give yourself that space. Don't think you're going to fix it all at once either. Um, and, you know, if it gets to feel a little intense, back off, you know, to give yourself a moment. I, it's my best advice because I think, everybody's journey is just very different and there's a lot of resources, but your intuition, this, I will say with a firm knowing and belief, you have the answer within. You just have to listen to yourself and trust that it's okay to start to, to go down that path. Mm -hmm. And a big red flag, I think should always be, if somebody says, or community or religion or anyone says, this is the only way that something is, that's like, run. 
<laughs> run. Exactly. Because there's not there's not one way to do anything. There's multiple ways to, to get to the same to the same path or wind around a different way. There's never one answer to anything. No, I you're so right, and it's like question everything. Even if you think like I have my life's together, but my parents were great, but just go and even look at like your belief structures because they were instilled by the time you were five. 50% mm -hmm. of everything you've ever learned is like boom, programmed in there. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, even just getting to know that of like, oh, this is why, this is why I like these things. And what if I opened my mind and decided that I wanted to do that? And I, I think the other thing that I want to say right here to you, and this just feels called to say, is like, there's no such thing as original sin. There just isn't. And if we could, if we, I mean, imagine if we remove that from humanity and that, that, that sense of relief that people would have of like, oh, I'm not a sinner. Mm -hmm. Fear-based practices. Yeah, it's all fear. Mm -hmm. And conditional. Right. And conditional. Right. Right. I love that. Yeah, That's... I love that because we we I don't. It's not right to put conditions on ourselves or other people. Uh -uh. Yeah, not this at is, all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this has been such fun talking to you. I've enjoyed this so much. Yeah, me it's, too. It's been great, and I and I hope that people can get inspiration from your story. And um, if people are feeling stuck, finding a way to get out of their stuckness by trusting themselves, trusting their intuition, finding their community, believing in themselves, mm -hmm. stepping out of their box. You stepped out of your box and that takes amazing courage. So I applaud you and I'm so glad that you are where you are now. Yeah, no, I, I am so appreciative for the life that I have, the life that has gotten me to this point. And again, even these kind of conversations and getting out and being able to talk about you know, my story is important, I think, just from a standpoint of like, you're capable, you're totally capable. And if you get really curious, that's so important. And I think if I could leave with any of the, the last two things are, is your imagination, our imaginations as humans is our superpower. And we have been cut off oftentimes from our dreams and we are free to dream again and we need people dreaming and being in touch with that deeper sense of who they are because that is going to bring about even more incredible change that we all deeply want at uh, at our core i believe mm -hmm. so you're free to dream again nah, i meant to that <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Connected Community Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like, share, and subscribe. I can be found at www.nikkiyyoga.com, N-I-C-K-Y-Y-Y-O-G-A.com. Until I see you again next week, I hope you have a beautiful day.